Good evening, everyone. What a great crowd we have tonight. I'm thrilled. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and I am so pleased to welcome you all here tonight for Plays with Words. This night of comedy opens our conference, Ways with Words, Exploring Language and Gender, which will continue here at the Knopfel Center tomorrow. Every year, the Radcliffe Institute hosts a conference to examine a timely issue through the lens of gender. In so doing, we affirm our connection to the historic mission of Radcliffe College, but we also host a gender conference because the interdisciplinary environment of our Institute for Advanced Study is precisely the right place to grapple with the multiple dimensions of gender in society. Where else would you find performers, poets, computer scientists, transgender rights advocates, political scientists, and more deep in conversation? No such effort comes together all on its own. So I am grateful to John Huth, our conference chair, co-director of our science program here at the Radcliffe Institute, and Donner Professor of Science in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Harvard. Thank you also to everyone at, at, Radcliffe, at the Radcliffe Institute, and believe me, it took everyone, especially Rebecca Wasserman and her staff who worked so hard to organize this ambitious event. In recent years, our gender conferences have explored a wide array of prominent public issues, migration, public health, and violence, just to name a few. And all of our gender conferences have begun with an arts event. We choose art as our first encounter with critical social, political, and cultural topics for reasons that go beyond the aesthetic. Art demands that we approach a subject in a new way, and we see it differently than we did before. One year, a dramatic reading by Eve Ensler propelled our inquiry into gender and the public's health. Uh, at a conference on immigration, we launched it with a musical performance by Quetzal, a bilingual rock band from East Los Angeles. This year, we open with performances by Aperna Nancherla uh, and Improv Boston. I want to thank them all, as well as Professor Glenda Carpio and local B WBUR radio host Robin Young, who will be leading our discussion. More arts programming accompanies this conference, and it surrounds us here at Radcliffe in general. And I urge you to visit, in particular, an exhibit that has just gone up, A Language to Hear Myself, Feminist Poets Speak, uh, which is next door at the Sussinger Library, and it will be open throughout the spring. One week from tonight, just to mention one more event, on Thursday, March 10th, Lucy Tapahanzo, who is the po Poet Laureate of the Navajo Nation, will be giving a poetry reading. The calendar cards on your seats will list, list more upcoming events, and I hope you will join us for many of them. Tonight's evening of comedy has brought students and faculty, artists and alumni, social workers and CEOs, electrical engineers, medical practitioners, activists, and more together here in the Knopfel Center. You represent nine different Harvard schools, nearly two dozen local universities, and several area public schools. You have come from all over New England and as far afield as the University of Notre Dame and the National Theater of Canada. I know that others are watching our live li um, webcast tonight and that many more will watch the video on our website in the months and years to come. The breadth and diversity of our audience tells us something about the genre of comedy. The urge to laugh is universal. Humor can soothe tensions, cross divides, and unite people through the medium of shared laughter. But paradoxically, what makes people laugh is not universal at all. A joke that is funny in one time, place, or culture does not automatically translate across time, space, or context. And while the action of laughing can bring people together, 
The content of jokes can sometimes drive people apart or divide them into groups of ridiculers and ridiculed. Comedy then might make us feel lighthearted, but it is no intellectual lightweight. It does important social and cultural work, and activists of all kinds know that. In 2014, for example, transgender advocates petitioned John Stewart and Stephen Colbert to, and I quote from their demands, uh, reject transphobia and respect gender identity. The petitioners wanted support from Stewart and Colbert on transgender right, gender rights because they knew that the popularity of The Daily Show and The Colbert Report had contributed, in the words of their petition to, and I quote, the recent cultural shift towards support for equal rights for LGBT people. In other words, activists sought to recruit two popular humorists precisely because they understood how much comedy matters. One reason why comedy matters is that it tells us a lot about the state of language. Jokes are only funny if you understand them. Frequently, understanding jokes requires understanding the words used to tell them. But words are not stable. Their meanings change over time, new words come into existence, and then they fade away. Ideas about gen gender change over time, too. The social roles assigned to individuals on the basis of sex and assumptions about relationships among and between sexes are in constant flux. They also vary widely from place to place and culture to culture. So comedy can reveal a lot about sex, gender, and sexuality in a particular historical moment. It reveals even more about how we use language to discuss challenging issues. So let me give you three examples. We know that William Shakespeare played to the pit. So even the most serious history plays or catastrophic tragedies were peppered with jokes that would be funny to cheap seat audiences. Take Henry IV, where scenes featured the portly knight, Falstaff, and the barmaid, Mistress Quickly. Today, the humor in their dialogue is not immediately apparent, unless we have an Elizabethan dictionary by our side. When Falstaff says to Mistress Quickly, and I quote, there's no more faith in thee than in a stewed prune, the phrase stewed prune sounds mildly entertaining to us, but we don't split our sides laughing. In contrast, 16th century audiences did laugh uproariously because they, unlike us, all knew that Falstaff had just called Quickly as faithful as a prostitute. Here's another example. In the spring of 1865, a comedy called Our American Cousins was playing at Ford's Theater in Washington, DC. That play contained a line, you sockdologizing old man trap. That line doesn't mean very much to us today, but John Wilkes Booth was an accomplished actor who knew that script inside and out and he knew that that line would get the most laughs in the entire play. He shot Abraham Lincoln at that exact moment when that line was delivered because he assumed the audience would laugh so hard that nobody would hear the gunshot and he would have precious time to get away. It turned out he was right. A more contemporary example comes from Seinfeld, the hit television comedy of the 1990s. In one episode, Elaine agrees to pose as the girlfriend of a gay man who has a homophobic boss. After a pleasant evening at the opera, Elaine decides that she will convert the man, that's her language, and she asks him if he ever considered what she calls changing teams. Now that we know about the pernicious phenomenon of subjecting boys to abusive so-called conversion camps in efforts to cure them of their sexuality, we in 2016 have a very difficult time hearing that line as light or funny. This last example is recent enough for many of us in this room to remember, which reminds us that the evolution of both language and gender happens constantly. It is happening now. 
What is funny today may not be so amusing tomorrow. Noticing when we laugh and when we don't can provide valuable insight into the state of language and gender at this precise moment in time, which is the subject of our gender conference this year. I said at the beginning of uh, these remarks that the purpose of our gender conference is to look at an important topic through a lens of gender. To return to that metaphor, comedy calibrates the prescription for that lens with exquisite delicacy. By looking through it, we can see our own moment in our own cultural context with heightened clarity. I can think of nobody more qualified to help us do so than the talented performers and insightful co commentators we have with us this evening. And your program contains informative biographies about all of them, and I encourage you to take a good look at it. So here is how the evening will proceed. First, Aparna will treat us to a stand-up performance. Next, Robin Young, co-host of WBUR's Here and Now, will moderate a discussion between Aparna and Glenda Carpio, professor of English and African and African American Studies here at Harvard. Then we will enjoy a performance by the improvisational comedy group Improv Boston. After their performance, Improv Boston members will join in the conversation with Aparna and Glenda. And finally, the floor will be open to you for your questions. If you would like to ask a question, please form a line behind the microphone that will be put in the center aisle. Identify yourself and ask your question. In closing, let me just say that I hope to see you all back here tomorrow for a day of continued discussion at our Ways of, uh, of Words conference. So please join me in welcoming Aparna Nancherla. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, I do like, uh, what, a, what a warm up. Give it up for your, I know. It's <laughs> uh, well, I want to uh, jump right into things. I feel like, you know, we don't have a lot of time left uh, here on Earth. Things are, <laughs> things are ending, so it's good to get to the point. Well, I, I know this is an academic conference, and usually, you know, I perform in bars and various uh, also classy locations, but uh, I wanted to, in the spirit of the conference, put together my version of a lecture of just my experiences with comedy and language. And um, so th th I'll just jump right into it. Okay, here it is. You had me at YOLO. Uh, and it is a, a vague exploration of how language exists in an ever-evolving landscape. Uh, and of course, this title, I just got through a TED Talk random title generator. Um, <laughs> But uh, I thought it sounded pretty official. And, uh, you know, for lay people, is, uh, is basically ponderings on why does the detective emoji only come in one skin tone, but the blonde man emoji comes in all of them. Uh, and, of course, um, that begs for a picture. So there you go. There, there he is in all of his depth. And then versus, wait, why? <laughs> What? Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get an answer to this question, but it does it does seem like you would need like a multicultural sleuth on the case. And unfortunately, all we have is a boy band to help us. Um, so uh, just a disclaimer right off the top, uh, because I can't get sued again. I, 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 don't, I just don't have the time. I have many naps to take. So I just want to cover all my bases. I know this is a conference on language, but I just wanted to say I, I cannot speak highly enough of images. I'm a big image fiend. Uh, and I just I wanted to not take any power away from images before delving into language. Um, here's just a photo that I love that from I've taken in New York City where I live. It's one of my favorite photos because uh, it it kind of symbolizes everyone's attempt to just make it work. Uh, <laughs> we're all kind of doing the best we can. <laughs> I think that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I don't want to take anything away from Kimojis, which are the newest 
type of emoji that's out, uh, which is a way to express your feelings through our supreme leader, Kim Kardashian. Um, and there's really something for everyone. You can blow gum or see no evil or even graduate. I feel like that one is a little bit sarcastic, honestly. I don't know when you would ever use that. And then lastly, of course, uh, foremost keepers of words and language are authors. And even an author can't resist a nice headshot. Uh, the author photo is something that you can never take away from them. This man seems to be floating in space. <laughs> and this woman is uh, coming out of a tree. Uh, <laughs> So I, I just wanted to cover my bases. And then, of course, I know uh, language is, you know, playing with words and, and very much about words, but I know there are a lot of people uh, who are into numbers and hard data, and I just want to make sure uh, to give you guys something to rest your eyes on for a second. So there's just some figures for you. Um, this is just some, this is a light smattering of research that I did. Uh, so, yeah, so now let's get into the real stuff. Uh, so who am I? Like, language as a whole, yeah, I think you can say that language is very much informed by who is speaking it. Like, what is, who, like, the identity of the speaker is big. So a little bit about me and some of the lenses that I come from. Uh, I'm a comedian. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a friend. This is pretty much going to read, like, a really long Twitter bio. Uh, I'm an anxious depressive, I'm an introvert, I'm a feminist, I'm a heterosexual, I'm a cis woman, I'm a person of color, I'm a gently floating fuzzball. That one is for tax purposes. And, uh, and then I'm a florp, which uh, I recently started identifying as a florp. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I definitely know I am one. So that's part of my identity now. Uh, so we live in a very exciting time for language. I feel like the internet has really opened up the gates in terms of just allowing people access to a variety of things. For example, you can just slap a caption on a photo uh, and just give an animal a rich inner life that it didn't have before. Um, yeah, that one's pretty undeniable. It's, it's doing the work for me. Um, but even like just in interacting with people, like Facebook recently came out with a new uh, set of reactions. So instead of just liking things, you can also love, ha ha, yay, wow, sad, angry, which incidentally, this is also kind of a life cycle of me on Facebook, <laughs> like at the top of my news feed versus how I'm feeling by the end. But uh, it's interesting, after this came out, I uh, made a tweet joke that was this. Why is there no Facebook reaction for Rasbuto, the Russian word meaning the hollow feeling for someone you used to love but no longer do? <laughs> Which I think applies to a lot of the posts I check on Facebook. Uh, and then I learned uh, after posting that that Rasbuto is not a Russian word at all. It's in fact not, it was somehow incorrectly appropriated to the Russian language and then spread so quickly on the internet that it has now become a word in its own right that is attributed to English, but it has fake Russian roots. Uh, and I guess, you, you know, so we've all been there. We've all claimed to be Russian. So uh, I understand, but it was a funny, uh, <laughs> it was a funny little study in how quickly language can change. Uh, and, of course, language is the key to access, accessing lots of things, like in the most literal sense, like a Wi-Fi password gives you access to the Internet. Uh, CAPTCHA is a word that proves that you're not a robot. Um, so these are just like literal uses of language. But then I wanted to spend the next part of the presentation just talking about how language and communicating with me like and technology has sort of fallen into place recently in my life. Uh, does anyone, let me just poll the audience really quick. Does anyone text with their parents and or children? Is anyone? Oh, very polite. Okay, great. Uh, so you all will know that uh, I, I text with my mother, and it's not always easy. Like, it can be challenging. Uh, 
usually people don't even cheer when you ask them. Like if they text with their parents, they're just like, please respect my privacy during this difficult time. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I've been texting with my mom and I feel like she went through a journey of like learning to text. Like this was one of her first texts. It was, uh, it was pretty much like an email. Like she would put my name in the subject and then, uh, and then she'd put the message. And this one was, a, this one was at the very beginning. Uh, Hope Nashville was fun. When we got married, dad would. And that was it. That was <laughs> it. We never learned what dad would do. Um, we never got closure on this message. But, but then she got a little bit better. And she started using it as kind of a tracking device. Like, this is when... We were, I believe, in the MoMA together. She was like, are you on level four? And then I tried to tell her where I was, and then she said, already on ground floor and hungry, please. <laughs> Which really feels like a metaphor for the struggle <laughs> in general. And then, uh, and then lastly, she just put my sister and I on the same text chain and was like, this is just what you're going to get. Uh, I did what you guys suggested. For the first time in my life, I went to a movie by myself. Gone Girl is a powerful movie. I liked it. <laughs> so she's just basically blogging in a very tight circle. I'm really proud of her. <laughs> but then she did get, she got very, like, advanced. Like, she started sending photos. Like, one day she just sent the moon for some reason. I guess she just clicked into her lunar cycle finally. She's like, bitter, bitter moon today, lovelies. That was it. That was the whole, that's all she wanted to say. And then she actually reached an end point recently, a few months ago, where she just sent this. Texts are not satisfying. <laughs> Which essentially just feels like she broke up with me. Um, <laughs> so it feels like she really had a whole eat, pray, love adventure on her phone. <laughs> and then meanwhile, to compare her to my dad, this is the range of my dad's texts. This is a classic. That one's a good one. Uh, it's either that or it's just very pointed questions that don't <laughs> really, you don't know what they're in reference to, but you know that it demands an answer immediately. Uh, so family, that's like kind of communicating with my family. And then I was like, okay, well, what else? People love, people are looking for love. Is anyone currently online looking for love? Okay, it's fine. No one, no one ever cheers for that. I have to find the right noise. I have to be like, if you're on there, make a quiet hiss. I don't know what the noise is. I haven't found it yet. But I, I'm, on, I'm on all the sites. I'm on OK Cupid. I'm on uh, Tinder. You know, I spent a few weeks on Yelp. But I just wanted to... I just wanted to go through a couple of the messages I've gotten. Because I, I feel like I stopped responding, and it got to a point where I'm like... Well, I, these men, like, if they don't, they're putting themselves out there, and if they don't have a voice here, then where are they going to find that in society, you know? Uh, so I just put together sort of an in memoriam montage of those we have lost uh, in the past year. This one's a classic. Hello, dear lady. Your appealing beauty, cute, sober, and captivating face has forced me to send a message to you. Can we tread on the path of friendship together? I like you much. Uh, so this is clearly a robot <laughs> who somehow got an account. I don't know what happened. But it doesn't really improve once, even when you know they're human, like this one. There, how are you? It's clearly a cut and paste gone wrong. <laughs> there, oh, what happened to hi? Someone else got that one. Uh, there, how are you? I enjoyed reading your profile. I feel we have few things in common. <laughs> oh, then I think we're pretty much done <laughs> with the few things that we have in common. Um, this one is a profile of a man who messaged me. I'm a man looking for more than most men are, which is someone who wants the same but wants to have fun getting there, which is ri basically just a riddle from a bridge troll. <laughs> None of that makes sense. And then he writes, I am a work alcoholic. <laughs> uh, I think a work alcoholic is just a comedian. Uh, is, uh, so it's just a, a fancy way to say it. 
Uh, and then this one is to the point. Come smoke weed. But it's more when it was sent, which is on Christmas. Uh, again, it's like men communicate differently, you know? It's clearly, that was his gift for that year. Uh, and then this man, not a man of many words, is in a frowny face. Uh, but then, like a gentleman followed up three months later with, we should definitely talk. He felt like he got off on the wrong foot with the frowny face three months ago. I can teach you how to golf. Uh, and then this man just straight up wrote a poem. Uh, we don't have to read it, there's no time. Uh, but basically the gist is that love is like a sword fight uh, between uh, your heart and these eyes. Uh, so, you know, men clearly communicate differently. That I hope you garnered some of that distinction through some of those messages. And if you're not online, please get on there. You're missing out. Uh, another thing that happens a lot as a comedian is you get a lot of internet comments. Mine pretty much range from hate, which is like this one, what is your problem? which was really in reference to nothing, to just mild confusion of you, you entirely. That's so true, Doug. Who is Doug? Who is Doug? This was never answered. She just wrote this on my wall. <laughs> I think it's someone's aunt. Uh, but basically, let's see, oh man, time. Okay, I have to wrap it up, so I'll skip this next. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I just wanted to do real quick, uh, these are some new words that I learned today, just to help you guys uh, I was like, you know, I need to learn some new slang words, so just that, so everyone can learn with me. Here's some Netflix and chill if you want to casually hook up with someone. Snatched on point, it's the new fleek. Fleek is done. Uh, you heard it here first. There's extra, when you're trying too hard or being over the top. Ship, there's two people you want to be in a relationship together. Like if you're like, I ship. Kevin and Tracy, then that means you want him to find true love. Sleeved, someone with undeserved confidence. And OTP, one true pairing, a couple you are emotionally invested in. Clearly, a lot of these are sort of female driven. Uh, but uh, here's the twist one of them I made up. Care to wager a guess? <laughs> shit, shit, shit. Sleeved. Sleeved, you're right. Okay. I got to go back to the drawing board with my attempts to influence language. Uh, and then uh, basically in conclusion, which is a word I made up that means confused conclusion because I don't think I really came to any true points here. Uh, this is a quote from Jay-Z, wordsmith, known wordsmith and rapper. Remind yourself, nobody built like you, you design yourself. And that can be about you or it can be about language. Think about it. Uh, okay, that's gonna be it for me. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Okay, let's do that again. Aparna and Sharala, people. I think what's going to happen now is they're going to bring up some chairs and yes. things, and we're going to all sit here. I'm not sure that's okay. a chair. I believe that's a stool. Yes. But I think we're going <laughs> to. It is. 84,000 Twitter followers. Oh. She, I mean, again, applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. While we're getting ready to sit down, yeah. what, why is your Twitter handle a par napkin? A par oh, a par napkin. It's because I, uh, I was on Twitter before people were using it as a professional tool. <laughs> so I was still, still trying to be cute when I came up with my handle. It still haunts me today. It's a, you are, you define yourself as a crumpled napkin? Yes. That's sad. Is it? Oh, I'm not sure. We'll discuss. But okay. first I want to let people know who's up here with us. Glenda Carpio, professor of English and African and African American studies at Harvard. Yeah. And she's got a terrific book, Laughing Fit to Kill, in which she's looked at uh, comedy and just uh, very interesting, through a very interesting filter of race. And so we're going to get started here. Why a crumpled napkin? You're not a crumpled I, napkin. No, I think I just like it because it, um, 
it's like something that you absorb things and like ideas and then you sort of you just you're muddled but you're sifting through things okay yeah and that's what you do like I was noticing one of your tweets you you talk about emojis you sent one out why is there only one white snowman I know it's a real problem real problem <laughs> um, so the overarching conversation of the two days is how uh, language changes over time, maybe because as you know, issues of sexuality and gender maybe bend the language a bit. When you're doing your comedy, mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel it evolve? I was thinking, um, for instance, might it be OK to do a joke now about Caitlyn Jenner because she's one and she's powerful, but it might not have been OK a while back? Yeah, I, I mean, I think comedy is very influenced by time and like there, like I remember reading an article where it was like someone was studying how soon after a tragedy, like a Twitter joke became funny, like it wasn't funny like hours after like this natural disaster happened, but then it was like he looked at it five weeks later and it was like then it was popular. So it, I do think there's an arc of people's like emotional uh, journey of like being able to accept something as funny once they've sort of distanced themselves from like the grief or the tragedy or or the struggle of something well the struggle and that brings to mind something I wanted to talk to you both about and Glenn I know you want to throw out some thoughts about this the Oscars did you all see Chris Rock uh, do the Oscars I mean right in the opening monologue Glenda there he is saying you know you might wonder why we weren't protesting not enough blacks previously well back in the day we were too busy getting raped and lynched to care who won best Oscar for documentary short. I mean, that was hilarious, but yeah. talk about that. But well, when it was, t it's time for something. Well, I mean, I think, you know, a statement people hear often about comedy is that comedy is tragedy plus time, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, racial inequality in America is not over, right? So if there's no time, so it's, it's, it's constantly floating between tragedy and comedy, right? So. Mm -hmm. The moment in which Chris Rock says that is a moment that some feel the tragedy is still there, still so urgent, it's not ready for, for comedy. And others feel differently. People laugh in and out of synchronicity right, from different vantage points. Um, but I think that's, like, that's one of the most powerful aspects about humor, is that it doesn't always just entertain. It makes you feel incredibly uncomfortable. Well, right? he, he then kept going. I mean, after he talked about African Americans getting raped and lynched, we're too busy, uneasy laugh. And then he says, when your grandmother's swinging from a tree, you don't care who, he just kept going and kept going all night. Yeah. In fact, he was, you featured a skit of his in one of your books, I think. Yeah. <laughs> he was, I mean, he was talking about um, what does, when slaves go on vacation. Right? Uh, and it's like, <laughs> oh, should you, we know, laugh? you go around, to the well, you know, and you meet the other slave who's also taking vacation by going around the well, you know. I mean, one of the things about, about comedy, about race, is, and especially about, you know, labor, right, it's like, again, the discussion of reparation is, is still very much alive, right? Um, Wall Street was the place where the New York slave uh, trade market was on, literally, the geographical space, right? Wall Street, itself, the wall was built by slaves, right? Nearby, there's an African burial, right? So there's the fact of America being built, built by slave labor is true, mm -hmm. right? And so riffing on taking a vacation if you're a slave in the now with Chris Rocks, and this is partly one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, mm -hmm. which is like one of the things about Chris Rock that's really amazing as a comedian is that he, like Richard Pryor, is like this little body with the, this voice, right, that just, and the, the contrast between the lightness of his body, the things he says, and the voice itself, I think also makes for a very pungent kind of comedy, you know? Um, Do you so, think about your physicality when you're? Yeah, but I don't think it's as, uh, it's more of the thing of your being perceived sort of outside in, whereas when you're performing, you're sort of thinking inside out. So I don't like sort of take it into consideration when I'm, thinking through my act, but I think often it's put on you. 
like your identifiers are put on you as a performer. Will you acknowledge that? Oop, I think I just dinged, sorry. Will you acknowledge, sorry. Uh, will, <laughs> are you texting someone? I, okay. I was tweeting your whole thing, it was great. Um, but you acknowledge that, if I'm reading correctly, when you come out and do your regular stand-up, you kind of say something like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying I know to? Just because people have an expectation of, you know, what they think a stand-up comedian should look like or what a performer should look like. And I think I had performed enough times that I sort of was like, okay, well, I'm just going to address that so I can move on to what I actually want to talk about. I'm just like, okay, I get it. I don't look like what you think I should look like. But I know. Mindy on. Kaling and me. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. it. But can, can, let's find out about you. Um, uh, the daughter of two doctors. Mm -hmm. Did I understand... Uh, you actually chose between West Point and Amherst College? Yeah. That's funny. I know. Is that fun? That's yeah. funny, isn't it? <laughs> really pushing the indecisiveness of myself to, to a bit. Uh, Which one, by the way? Where did I go? Amherst. Amherst, yeah. 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 I, don't, I don't think I would be here if I well, But what did that tell us about you? What, you know, indecisive, but what more did that tell us about you? I think just that I... I I think I have like distinct ideas of like identities I want to inhabit. Like I was interested in West Point as a kid because I was really interested in like leadership and like survival and I, for some reason I was fixated on like if I was dropped in the middle of the woods, could I hack it? Like I don't I had that and then I had like oh like I want to lose myself in a book. Like that so I had these <laughs> two uh, sort of identities and I, I think so I just You're basically trouble. a comedian from the get-go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it all was like in my head too because it is like it comes in a sort of unexpected package so I think it, it surprises people. Yeah, I know Glenda one of the things we were talking before, one of the things you wanted to talk about is um, language and some of the most, one of the, the most prominent women that we're seeing right now, Hillary Clinton. Mm. What are some of the questions that are being raised for you? She's so stiff, right? I mean, and so like lacks like a, a sense of, uh, you know, self comedy, you know, I mean, not that she has to have it, but like, you know, what does it mean to hold the platform as a woman? I think you can become that stiff. One of the things that was immediately funny to me about your, your, your setup was doing lecturing as a woman, right? I mean, especially when I started here, you know, I was fresh out of grad school. I looked like a grad student, right? So getting up on the podium to lecture was already kind of, you know, a kind of funny situation. I had to perform the idea of a Harvard professor, right? So, <laughs> the, and I didn't look the part. Which I, what I loved about, you know, your piece was that you did like the fake etymology, that whole thing, the whole idea, the genre of the lecture, you know, that people expect. And, you twisted it around, right? So I'm thinking about Hillary Clinton, what kind of scripts does she have to follow? You know, what is, as a, as a political animal, right? Well, How does she have to hold back? How does she have to, I mean, you were saying, what if a woman was saying the insane things that, that Trump is saying, you know? Well, yeah, uh, I mean, or what, what if a woman came out and she was older, in her 70s, with wild graying hair, and she talked in exclamation points like right. that. We looked up at the, the mashup of Trump's and Clinton's face. Have you seen it? If you want to be <laughs> terrorized, you go. If you have this like, kind of perverse desire to they, they have like, their a terrible image, together. Yeah. yeah, it's horrible. But, we, but, but I mean, do you, did you feel this ever as a comedian? Because we were talking about how Hillary Clinton in many ways, I mean, you know, she comes out and she, this is wonderful moment and I've been privileged to meet her uh, personally many times and she's loose and sweet and small and you know, just to completely, but you feel as if she's being forced into jackets and pantsuits and a certain Horrible kind of pants. thing that, so that she'll come out. I mean, the first thing, if you win a primary, mm -hmm. the first thing, you, you walk on the stage and people are cheering, would you say immediately, Thank you. We are. I am going to build a ladder. Is that the first thing you'd say? No. You'd say, "Oh, isn't this great?" Or "Wow." Or, but she. It feels like she's been robbed of that language. Do you, I mean? Yeah. I mean, I also feel like women in general are fed so many contradictory messages. Like in the end, it does drive you crazy, and you're like, "I don't know how to be. I'm just going to be a robot." I, like, I, I get be a robot, that. so no one can criticize. Well, another thing we wanted to ask you about is, um, remember in August, 
when Naomi Wolf wrote a piece in The Guardian about vocal fry. Do you, do you, are some of you familiar with that? Um, there are, uh, it was a criticism of young women in particular. Mm -hmm. They show up a lot on This American Life, and they talk like that, and they have vocal fry. And uh, her, Naomi felt that this was just an affect and that young women uh, should get over it, that it was demeaning to them, and it was much like, you know, it was, she, she said it was like a valley girl who had gone to a rave the night before and lost her voice. <laughs> Well, I called a, um, a professor at Oxford, um, uh, can't, her name escapes me right now, but she's a feminist and a linguist professor, linguistic professor in, in the UK, and I thought she was going to say, yes, it's important, it's much like up talk at the end of sentences, and instead she said, do not do this to young women, mm -hmm. because young women, it's, it's just like shaming them for the way they dress, and don't shame the way they talk, and further, Young women change language. They're some of the leaders in changing language. You had some thoughts about that. That we well, any I mean, it was a broad generalization, but it works for ethnic groups, racialized groups, right? There's a standard way of speaking, which is often connected to a standard race, right? And so, or class, right? I mean, the way that people in Europe have like a sense of social difference is dialect and accents, right? Mm -hmm. The way we do it here is phenotype. Right, and we do a phenotype and language, right? And so it's gendered, race, we hear all of that in the way people speak. Well, we right? were saying that, um, I, I realized, I love to say, and I'm all. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> he was all this, and then I was all that. I love it. That came <laughs> from young women. I, every, I, I, in, I interview Nobel Peace Prize winners, and they begin their sentence with, so? You know, so your thoughts on that, to speak more as this woman that I'm talking about, yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree with uh, not shaming women for how they talk. And just language in itself is such a fluid, uh, changing thing that I think to, to sort of put restrictions on how people talk or how they sound is such a, it's in, it's, you know, it's a way of like holding people down or like silencing them of being like, oh, well, how you talk is really annoying to everyone, so maybe don't talk as much. Like that's, basically what you're saying to women, you're like, don't talk, we don't like it. I'm like, I thought we were past that. Yeah. We can vote, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the perennial question that people often get asked, women get asked in comedy, it's like, are, are women funny? You know, like I yeah. said, it's, it's this insane question that keeps getting asked. It's like, it's like really the under commentary, it's like, are you human? Yeah. You know? I mean, and yeah. it's strange it like re like it's it's current now or I guess it's we're in the like ebb of it because it's like Amy Schumer is like Tina Fey, Tina Fey Kristen Wiig and but it is like this argument that comes up like every 17 years like cicadas or something where it's like <laughs> we have to solve this again yeah. it's like nothing changed I know. Yeah. Right. Very strange. What about physical humor, though? You were saying that it's still hard. Well, you know, I mean, I think of Eddie Murphy, right? When like we, he got on stage, he came out. One of my students in uh, Black Humor said that he looked like a human condom, right? When like those those leather outfits that he had, you know, I mean, he was like a walking penis, right? Mm -hmm. And like he would bowl his <laughs> penis, you know, and like all that, you know. I mean, it's the kind of stuff that you know, if you do that, you are as a woman, it's a totally different scene, you know. Um, Wanda Sykes does this amazing bit about um, um, going to a titty bar in, Flo in Florida, right? And she and she's amazing at the physical comedy of it, but there are very few women who can risk that because it has, you know, you you immediately you're sexualized anyway, right? But if you draw attention to it through comedy, people are going to stop at the sex and not and kind of let go of the humor somehow, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, someone like Louis C.K. can make comedy out of his belly, right? But think about a fat woman coming out and doing comedy about a belly, right? That would be, like, there's so much baggage about, around women and their physicalness that I think people can't even really even laugh at it, you know? Yeah, well, I think even between, like, men and women, like, specifically in those, like, I guess, binary terms, like, I feel yeah. like there is, like, a masculine sense of humor and like way of being and then there's like a more feminine sort of like character driven and like subtle nuanced way of joking and I do feel like both male and female comedians weave between the two but yeah. I do think that it is like often female comedians are expected to adapt more masculine traits 
and qualities, whereas more men don't cross over. Because I will see sometimes men in the audience sort of check out during a female comedian set, but it's only because her style is not the same, like set up punchline, set up punchline, uh -huh. set up punchline, and they're just like, I don't understand. And they like, <laughs> they're, they're just like, eh, it's not for me, but it's like, it shouldn't be like female comedy is like a niche thing. Like it's like, we're all right. human, so it's like it's all one spectrum, but it is like that is what stand up started as chiefly, so that's what like people think stand up is. But it's crazy though, because if you really think about, about comedies, like let's just take the example of American culture, right? Some of it was minstrel stage, right? And so much of it was like people cross dressing, right? Yeah. So it was like, white men playing black and playing female, right? And so it's like all this like getting very close to all these taboos, yeah. right? That are then all like be all constantly alive, right? And so when you yeah. do stand up without the minstrel setup, right? It's yeah. interesting that we can't go to those taboos or that they're, you know, they're alive on stage in a very different way. Right, right, right. right. I just had a couple questions, because um, again, we're going to have a performance from uh, Improv Boston, which we can't wait. And I think, I don't know if I've got this right, but I think that they're actually going to be playing off some of the things we've set up here. Oh, joy. <laughs> so, um, um, I, somehow, I'm thinking parody. <laughs> um, and also, we're going to get your questions. But I just had one. Every word that you spoke, you may not want to let us inside your um, process, but every word that you spoke when you did this was perfect. There was. Whoa. There was. <laughs> it was. Uh, Wasn't I it? I like really have to dig into that therapy exercise of accepting a compliment. Breathe. Um, no, but it was. And so is, it, is that because you spend hours making sure that, you know, do you craft it that way? Is this... I mean, I come, I feel like stand-ups have, uh, you know, some come to it from a more sort of organic of like talking their ideas out on stage. I think I have a more writerly mind of where and sort of control issues where I have to like know what I'm gonna say for the most part ahead of time. So I think I do latch on to like phrases and like, and I like love language and I love wordplay. So I think I sort of build my jokes and ideas around like, just like a set of words or a set of phrases. So I think that sort of runs through what I do. And this was a language lecture. Right. Um, but I, I just loved how you seem to love words. What's that one that's over? Because I didn't know that it was. Fleek. I'm sorry. I'm fleek. What? What is it's okay. it? Okay, I was I was when I when I made that slide, I was like, I don't know if you're reading the room right. <laughs> No, I'm not the room. Um, does it, what does it mean? On fleek is like on point, like if you're like... Right. Tom Ashbrook. Oh, that's, I'm sorry. That's, that's a Boston, sorry, go oh. ahead. Yeah. But yeah, like it looks like it's like spot on. Oh, yeah. if I, but if I start using it now, it's... It's usually like more about like someone's appearance or something. It's but like, it's over, that word is I, over. Yeah, apparently okay. it's snatched. <laughs> do you, and one last thing, do you... Either of you, you know, you work with words, you work with words. I work with news and work with words that way. Uh, we, we had a crazy day today. I don't know if you know, Mitt Romney got up and excoriated Donald Trump. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, and then Donald Trump got up and excoriated him back. And I was working, trying to, because we update for different time zones, and we're trying to listen, and I looked up at one point, and you know how CNN has the banner that goes across the bottom? And it said, Trump, Trump, colon, I ruined my carpet endorsing Romney. <laughs> and I just, I know. And apparently he'd had a fundraiser for uh, Mitt Romney, and people had come with muddy shoes and ruined his carpet. And so he'd gone on a whole screed about how he should bill Mitt Romney for his carpet from the time he'd helped. But I mean, you could tell someone at CNN had just lost, it was just like, <laughs> lost their mind. So, do you know, <laughs> Trump. I ruined my carpet endor endorsing Romney. Do you ever find it's like too hard to be funny because real life's so funny? Oh, like he's all, it's like a joke on a joke. We, what do you do with that? That he really said. I know, I know. I mean, it's funny. Like with, with all of that going on right now, it is like 
as a comedian, it's interesting. Like part of it is almost like we are living in a fever dream and it's like, do you make jokes about it or are you just like, let's just put cold towels on our faces? <laughs> um, but I still think you can make a joke on, you know, I feel like you can, as a comedian, you always, like, your goal is to heighten whatever the reality is. So I think, like, you know, if he if he said that about his carpet, it's like, what else would he say it about? Like, there's always some direction to go. Well, that it's just feels set up like, for a sexual joke. Yeah, know, like, yeah. I ruined my carpet. Yeah, yeah there's something <laughs> distasteful so there. Weird. <laughs> yeah, That's so weird. What? <laughs> Okay, let's stop there. Uh, Glenda Carpio, Glenda Carpio, a partner named Charlotte. Uh, wonderful. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take our seats and we're going to invite members of Improv Boston to come on up. And guys, why don't we start making the transition? Um, we'll move the chairs. Improv Boston, ladies and gentlemen, have you been to Central Square? One of the great shining jewels of Boston uh, over there in Porter Square. And they also uh, visit uh, hospitals in different places, taking their fun stuff uh, to places where it really lands. Uh, but I have a feeling now they're going to skewer us. And so, <laughs> Improv Boston. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Robin. We are Improv Boston. Uh, my name is Dina. I'm Kelly. Hi, I'm Greg. My name's Corey. I'm Sarah. Rosna. And I'm Mike. Thank you so much for your smattering of applause. Uh, so, uh, Aparna is a brilliant stand-up and a writer, and as Robin said, uh, her words were perfection. So Aparna spent a lot of time making sure that every word she says up here was going to be exactly right. We do a different style of comedy <laughs> uh, called improvisation, where we haven't prepared anything at all, and we have no idea what's going to come out of our mouths. However, uh, it's still perfection. Oh, well, <laughs> we'll let them be the judge, Corey. But we hope that's the case, and we assume it will be, but uh, the audience is ultimately the judge of that. Uh, so what we're going to do is an improvised set, and as Robin mentioned, we're going to take our inspiration tonight from what we have all just experienced. So we're going to use what Aparna had to say, we're going to use what Glenda and Robin had to say, and other information about the conference, and we're going to be completely making everything up on the spot. So what you're about to see has never happened before. I assure you it will never happen again. Uh, everything's going to be improvised just for you, and that means we may need your help. So throughout our 23 minutes and 40 45 seconds. We might be coming to you all for some suggestions. We've got some microphones. We can run right out into the audience. All of you look afraid right now. It's fine. <laughs> I promise it will be completely fine. So let's just get a little bit warmed up, right? So uh, just for everyone, I'll just ask what your name is, and on the count of three, you'll yell it out. It'll be very easy. What is your name, one, two, three? All right. the viewer that names. Right. Jennifer, I don't know, I didn't. Uh, it was a terrible question, I couldn't hear any of it. Uh, you're all named Glenda now. So uh, we're going to, to start our set tonight. We just heard some really uh, inspiring things by Glenda and Aparna and Robin. What is, uh, from someone in the audience, something that you heard uh, in their discussion, one word that stuck out to you? This is a language conference after all. Carpet. Carpet. Thank you. Thank you. Carpet. Carpet. Just, it's ruined. The carpet is completely ruined right I, now. I feel like uh, this is like the time that I spilled coffee on my pantsuit and no one told me. And you know how many pantsuits I have ruined endorsing political candidates? <laughs> you got blonde hair? Yeah. I got blonde hair. Yeah. You want to start a boy band? Oh my god. I also have blonde hair. Just saying. <laughs> um, I'm just going to rest this joke here for a second. In five hours, it'll be funny. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sarah. I will be playing the part of your professor today. I might not look like your professor, but that's who I will be playing today because I am a performer. Uh, hello, my name is Dina. I will be playing the part of a student okay, today. Okay, it's my turn. Professorship is hard. Did you have a question? Uh, I I just wanted to say that I, I actually went to Emerson, so it's a miracle they're letting me in this building right now. Yes. <laughs> you guys, several times I was telling you about things that I wanted to tell you hey, about. Hey, excuse me. I just wanted to say. Sometimes. Oh. 
Can you please not? Really? You're, you're literally Martin. shaming me right now. I ordered a coffee yes. and it only came as a latte, so that. I upside down. I was Papa thinking Gino. that it would be good if we all were to just get Freeze. together. Freeze. Corey and Sarah switch characters. <laughs> So you were singing in a normal human speech pattern. Right. right. My thesis is about several things that have to do with comedy. As the head of pediatric Freeze. cardiology. Kelly and Sarah switch characters. <laughs> it's so necessary when I went to the market. I didn't get a piece of corn. So what you're saying is... <laughs> Freeze! Is there a volume? <laughs> Freeze. Greg and Dina switch characters. <laughs> it's so okay. Are you upset? It's okay. I can't. I'm having a hard time. This, what's the emotion? Uh, is he, do you need? Do you need help? Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Clinton, uh, I just need you to understand. <laughs> As. Yep. Our country's first major contender to be president, who is a woman. We are so honored to have you bring... I'm sorry, I have Mrs. Clinton's update ready. <sighs> yeah, uh, it's just, there we, we want you to be uh, more... I think you'll enjoy version 2.3. Okay. Freeze. Every time Miss Clinton speaks, she can only speak in a certain number of words. Between 1 and 30, how many words? Five. I heard five. Every time Miss Clinton speaks, it's in five words. No more, no less. Continue. Mrs. Clinton, we need you to be warm and also uh, cold. And we need you to be hard and we need you to be soft. And we need you to be strong and weak all at the same time. We need you to be vulnerable but impenetrable. And we need you to be uh, an achiever but also an underachiever. We want you to be successful and unsuccessful all at once. We don't want you to have too much experience, but we need you to have all the experience. How are you all doing out? <laughs> Do we have another update for Mrs. Clinton, or is this? So that, that was unfortunately the last one. Okay. This, uh, this is Clinton 4.0. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sure uh, I'm sure that people would love to hear what you have to say. Uh, so I know I have some questions for Mrs. Clinton. Uh, Mrs. Clinton, uh, excuse me. In in as many words as you possibly can, what is your vision for America? America is a place. That is true, America is a place. Does anyone have a question for Mrs. Clinton from the audience here? Would you like to ask Mrs. Clinton a question? Question, any question at all? Any question at all? I got one. Yeah, oh, we've got one here. Yeah, yeah uh, so what will be the first thing you do when you get into office? Very good question. Great question. More Ellen Show. Yep, as finger on the pulse of America. Woot. Great. Uh, I think we've got woot. another question here. Oh, good, because she'll woot for the rest of the hour. Woot. Who will your first cabinet appointment be? Great question. Who cabinet will, appointment. Cabinet appointment, first cabinet appointment? My husband, Bill, of course. Oh. Mixed reaction from the room. Not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> Fielding questions here. I only think it's appropriate that we have everybody involved. It's me, Donald. You didn't recognize it? Oh. <laughs> I mean, the, it's, it's, no, it's spot, spot on. on. <laughs> spot on. Well, does anyone have a question for Mr. Drump? For uh, Mr. Drump today, who has a question Drump, any... for Mr. Drump? No one wants to talk. Oh, to Oh, here Mr. we go. Oh. Yeah, right, right here. There. Yep. Yeah. You said earlier that you were upset uh, about your rug. Could you tell us a little more about that? I had a perfectly nice finished basement. Beautiful, beautiful finished basement. Had a corner bar and everything. Muddy feet's all over the place. Only rug I see on head. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Your face is on fleek. <laughs> you must be Tom Ashbrook. <laughs> <laughs> You're so snatched. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you two ship? <laughs> oh, shipping? OTC is what we are <laughs> oh. trying to get together at this party. <laughs> Guys, what about your sleeved? <laughs> <laughs> nice try, nice try. That was mad extra, though. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the Halloween costume I got. I mean, it was the last one at the store. I mean, it's, it's a walking penis. And <laughs> fix the hat. Switch it around. Put, is, put it around in the other side. It, put it around to the other side. Yep. Yep. I like it. This is less uh, aggressive. I feel like. Does it? You know, you don't. Oh, have there to, we go. You don't have to be sexy for Halloween. You don't have to be sexy at no, all. No, I'm just trying to have a costume. It's the only costume they had. Freeze, Greg. Let's hear your Oscar-winning moment. There's, just, there's a lot of people at this party I want to impress. I don't have a lot of friends, and well, it's a costume party, and you can't go to a costume party not in a costume. So I said, "What costumes do you got?" And he said, "Well, it's the day of Halloween. Not much, man." He said, "I got one for you, my friend. I got one. It's a walking penis costume." <laughs> Yeah, I said, how much? And he said, the deposit was $350. I said, I only got $250. Will it work? He said, sure, but you don't get the balls. Back to the scene. <laughs> Son, you've always been what we've wanted. You don't need a costume. Proud of you just the way you are. Huh? I would ditch that dick outfit, and I would move on to something else. Like being just you, perfect you. No costume at all. None. Except the one that I wear every day. <laughs> you know, the way society views me. It's the costume right, that I wear, mask right? It's the mask that I put on. How they make you There's feel really no way to remove it, right? It's the way that I'm viewed. Gotta, yeah. uh, Most people you know. don't understand yeah. me anyway. A lot of people aren't familiar with semiotics. I definitely am went to Harvard. And they're making, um, you know, assumptions about you all the time. People right, make assumptions right. about you all Freeze. the time. Freeze. Kelly, let's hear your Oscar winning moment. I just want my child to feel empowered, to be whoever they want to be. I want, I want Z to grow up and feel happy about the, the person that they've become. I feel like it just takes a little bit of courage and just the basic common sense to be the human that you are and that I know you can be. Just takes a bit of courage. Just a little bit. Back to the scene. Now clean this up because mommy doesn't like a messy floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sweetie, uh, please don't go see uh, Fifty shades of nonsense. Send. I just got the weirdest text from my mom. <laughs> Dot. Send. Oh, she means it. She put a period in there. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sh I know. Did I that say I just acted out Fifty Shades of Grey with Dad? Yes, that's exactly what it that says. That can't be what she meant to type. I, is that what you meant? Space, space, like, space, oh, space, nope. space. She's typing. My thoughts are very loud, send. Tell her I like chicken pot pie. <laughs> send. I don't know if they're asking me to dinner or what is happening Take here. a picture of my earlobe. It's gotten bigger than the other. <laughs> <laughs> And oh, right, and God, right. what is that Lobe. body part? I don't know. I don't know. What is that? I don't know. I feel like we're really communicating, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. You guys, it's what? fine. We just got dropped in the middle of the woods. Go read your books. I'm just going to build this fire by myself, OK? Would it help you to know that I'm reading a book in the Little House on the Prairie series and there might be some valuable information about that would how to live slightly, in the wilderness? Yes. Would it help or just be more ironic if I burn this copy of Fahrenheit 451? <laughs> <laughs> that would be both ironic and helpful, Chad, yes. <laughs> Look. What? We didn't all apply to West Point together for no reason, okay? Hey, I had a safety school of Amherst College. <laughs> Again, I just really want to go to Emerson. <laughs> West Point was our dream. That's why we're here. Sometimes dreams change. Say it again, Chad. Sometimes dreams change. One more time. <laughs> Sometimes dreams change. <laughs> when I look all around, I think that this you 
used to be my joy. His joy, his joy, his joy. But now I know, with you by my side, I don't need to go to West Point. West Point, West Point, West Point. Sometimes changes happen. Sometimes we change. Sometimes changes happen. Sometimes we change. I'm a bookworm reading Little House. Little House, just little a house. little house. Little and house, it's on a prairie. House. This particular book in the series isn't helpful because it's mostly about my sister, Mary. trip I brought not one, two, but three joints. It was my goal to get into West Point. West Point, you West Point. Me, you, you, and you, all of us. And looking around, there's no way out, no car, train, or bus. Sometimes things change. Sometimes. Have a seat. Thank you so much for joining me. Just gonna ask you a few qu Oops, sorry, that's oh. my phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, verily, verily, she is a, a saucy pomegranate in there. I swear, it's a spruce plum. I, uh, well, I've forgotten the line, but you get it. Play to the, play to the pit, sir. Play to the pit. Well. Hoops and fun and beavers and chuckles. <laughs> well done, Miss. Yes. Word from the king's come down. Everyone in the court has died. It's very tragic, very sad. And my wife is still a sprickly. Joffrey, come yeah. in here, please, yes. Joffrey. <laughs> you're offending a lot of people when you're saying these. It's it's no. the script. It's the script. The script says stewed prune. Well, thank you, I've been calling for nine all <laughs> freaking night! Do you understand the sort of people that you've offended thus far? What? Who? Who's, of, who's offended by... Tell screen? me the last thing you said. It was, uh, I believe it was uh, something about pears. You've, uh, been, you've offended all blonde-haired men. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, I, I will. I apologize. One more time, what's the line? Hit me with the line, one more time. I've forgotten again. You've got it deep down. I've got, nope, I've already forgotten it. Whenceforth, you pay. forgot. Oh, you've forgotten it too. No, nope. yes. all deep. Yes, never. Yes. Never. <laughs> never. Bloody hell, it's kumquat serve spot. Is that it? <laughs> We're all trying. We're all trying to gain an understanding of the language and how it works today. Yes, yes. I get this, but we have to be true. Now say the lie. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> Mm, it's not soggy plums, but I think it's soggy plums. It's not. Squares. 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 It's like Take the compliment. Boo! <laughs> 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 it just keeps going. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs>
going, I'm just going to change the recording. Oh, that's my laptop. <laughs> Play to the pit! <laughs> okay. For pumpkins, spice lattes, and all good rubbish. Hi ho, no. <laughs> <laughs> How are these now for the fellow? What are you, this here burnt marshmallow? Corey, take that couplet back. <laughs> oh my. What must I say they're sitting on this log? For you are just one extra salty hot dog. Corey, oh. take that couplet back. Sure. <laughs> when I said you must have been the lob, I would skewer you, you piece of shish kebab. Corey, take that couplet back, but this time wrap it. All right. Yeah. Yo, I'm looking at you, but I don't want to make you cry Cause you a nice piece of fluffy apple pie uh, Yeah, I'm saying it's a dream And you're just a piece of nice vanilla ice cream oh, All of guy, these things I I'm saying they are true it. Oh, And man, I just yeah, know that you are different kinds of okay. food oh. I'm gonna tell you, I'll tell you this quick Pour up a nice glass of that little lick Oh, Burr. it gets you in what, the funk What's this I hear? Oh, is this guy a rapper Shakespeare? Oh, <laughs> yeah. To the pit, I say, I'm just a portly milkmaid. <laughs> <laughs> from whence, from the bells, then I jam. I'm just saying, Princess of Bellingham. And I don't even say it that I'm not ventry. Oh, but I'm just helping full. What has happened to me? I think I'm dying. I think I might be. Drowning in the ocean. What is this? The mud thing. I feel like a basket of dried up figgy pudding. Oh. <laughs> I got I got expelled. You did? Yeah. Is it because your label fell off? Maybe, but they said it. One of the teachers told me to man up and um, I told what? him. What? Yeah. So I told him to woman up. Yes. Yes. That is how I raised my daughter. Thank you. Man up. Right. We what? push children out. Yeah, that, that's what women do. That's power. Thank you. So woman up. So that's what I said. I got right in his face and I was like, you've never pushed a baby out of your parts, buddy. Who's tough now? And then I started naming the parts, which may be okay. why I got expelled. That's, that was a little far, but I'm proud of you. Thank you. So that's really nice. But I'm, I think I need to have a meeting with your principal. No. Oh. We need to have a conversation. I know what's going to happen. He's going to cry. Thank you for joining me. You're welcome. What is the meaning of expelling my child? What is the meaning of anything, really? <laughs> what does expelled mean? She's a third grader and she said labia. <laughs> I, you should be proud that I know what that is. That's right, this is America. <laughs> it is Go the on. land of free speech. And my, my daughter had something to say. And she this is a common it. misinterpretation. Free speech means that you can say whatever you want, but you need to face the repercussions of what you do inevitably say. What? What, that's the oh, definition no. of free, that's literally what free speech is. That's how it's defined. Excuse me. Wait. I what? will not stand in America that will not let my daughter speak. Well, then have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. My point is, I raised her to speak her mind. Yeah! I raised her to be a strong yeah. lady. Yeah! Okay? And she's gonna come here tomorrow. Yeah. Because you're gonna revoke that expulsion. I'm here right now. And she is gonna speak her mind all day, all day. Matter of fact, she should have your job, Mr. Principal. Again, yeah. she's a third grader. I don't think that would be wise. <laughs> And I respect your <coughs> fervor here, but can we agree that you're mad that I said man up, which arguably is me exercising my own free speech? Wait a minute. I'm, I'm just saying is all. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's a kid phrase that I, 
I'd like to use. Just hey, say it. Hey, Rosna. Yes. I just wanted to say, you said expulsion earlier. Yes. Your words are perfection. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Sarah. Hey, Rosna. I wanted to call that out too, but I didn't know if it was appropriate. Totally appropriate. But you're perfect. Thank you, Cor thank you, Corey. You're welcome. Hey, Kelly. Hey, you Sarah. know what you're reminding me of right now? What? That Kim K graduation emoji. Oh. You know what that makes me feel like doing? What? The Kim K cry emoji. Oh. <laughs> you know what that makes me feel like doing? That Kim K highlighting emoji that exists for some reason where you see all of the makeup on my face but in different parts. Yeah. I think that's actually a contouring emoji, which implies oh. that her face is fat in some way. I thought it was and a kitty cat emoji and those were stripes. I think it's just I think. another way for people to make people feel bad about themselves. You know what? Oh. I think it's just another way people change. Huh. Mm, yeah. I'm not clear on emojis. Hey, Sarah? Yeah? Say that again. I will. People change. Say it what? one more time. One more time. People change. People change. People change. People change. People change. I think they're going to say one thing, but they don't. People change. People change. People change. People change. You want to say one thing, but you don't. Express your freedom people to all change. free speech. It doesn't matter what you people say or what change. you will recover. Just know that there's repercussions people that you must suffer. People starting to sweat. <laughs> you know, People like, do tell us that a lot, that they sweat watching us, that they're nervous for us, <laughs> that because we're, yeah. we don't know what we're going to say, it actually may, a lot of people cringe when we're, when we first start, they're just, they're rooting for us to yeah. succeed, which is great. Um, the, we do a lot of kids classes and the thing we tell the kids when they're getting nervous before they come out uh, to do their shows is uh, nerves and excitement are actually the same chemical in the body. So just convince yourself that you're actually really excited uh, and then let that propel you onto the stage. So it is, we are nervous, but uh, mostly we're just fooling ourselves uh, that it's gonna be a good time. <laughs> and then it is. Yeah. Well, it's also probably because there's, if there's no script, who knows what's gonna come out, which means that who knows what you're thinking. I mean, it's also a reflection. The audience knows that there's chaos. It's entropy, right? Yeah, like right. That's, what, that's what humor does. It allows entropy. And improv is all about that, right? Like yeah. letting the unconscious out as well. So that you signed up for the unexpected, both mm -hmm. from from the side of this this side of the stage, but also from the side of the audience. Mm -hmm. I, I personally find that to be a, a great relief. Uh, tonight I get to moonlight as the pianist, but my full time job is artistic director of the theater. Uh, so we think a lot about this idea of being in the moment. And and for me, uh, I was trained as a traditional actor. And having a script is terrifying, because there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer. You either do it right or you don't. Uh, and in improvisation, there is no right answer, there is no wrong answer, there's only what we create together. So that sense of, oh, we just, we're gonna go out on stage, we're gonna have a dialogue. That's, that's simple enough, you're always prepared to do that. Well, it's also gonna, you know, you open up yourself for a flop, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, yeah. improv <laughs> is, you know, I, Richard Pryor did a lot of improv before he became Richard Pryor, right? Mm -hmm. He found his voice by doing improv, which is a way of kind of, failing and, get, and finding the voice and doing that, right? But it takes a lot of courage to fail in front of everybody, right? Not that you did. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Probably did a little bit. I, I'm sweating now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I do think that's important, though, the idea of failure being something that we actually strive toward, the idea yeah. that we're not taking risks as comedians, then we're not actually doing our job. Yeah, um, and part of learning. Too. Yeah, in a, in a setting like this, where we know that there's this big overarching theme, and it's really important, and what everyone's here to do tonight and tomorrow is to talk about something so serious and so, uh, so important to what's happening in society right now, there's a lot of pressure on us walking into tonight, like, do we, we don't want to offend anyone. What if we say the wrong words? What if we get it all wrong? Uh, and the thing that uh, we tried to keep in mind tonight is the second we're in our heads about getting it wrong and saying the wrong thing, we won't be able to say anything. You won't be funny either. Right, so <laughs> just, just see what happens and hope that, uh, that if we've offended someone, they understand that uh, it was uh, unintentional and come talk to us after and we'll apologize and we'll have a beer or something. Um, or they'll punch you. Or that's, yeah, maybe. maybe. You seem very I angry at us. Do you want to talk about something? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking too that um, we were talking about physicality in women and here we had a woman being a penis Halloween costume. Beautifully, yeah. I might Thank say. You so You're welcome. <laughs> Your best work, right? Um, so we, we, a lot of the things that we were talking about just in comedy. I just want, Aparna, would, do you do improv too? I yeah. When I started, I took improv classes too, and and uh, did that alongside stand up for a long time. Yeah. What did it do for your? I mean, for me, it was really helpful in in like you guys were saying, like just. Let, letting go of the control as so much and sort of just exploring where things go. That's, I think, the beauty of improv is like you never know where you're going to end up and you sort of, you kind of trust the people around you and yourself to like know you'll land on your feet. Or not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, don't forget that we're going to ask you to, if you have questions for anybody up here, to be gathering them so that we can do that in just a few minutes. But um, so you didn't take any notes, and you remember you remembered more about our talk than I remembered about our talk. <laughs> Well, here's the great thing. Improvisation is a team sport. So it wasn't on any one of us to remember all of it. Each one of us grabs something that resonates with them, something that speaks to them. Uh, so if we all have a handful of things, there's seven of us, so it will feel like we all remembered all of it. Yeah, yeah that's our secret. Another <laughs> part of the, the improv training is active listening. You know, most of us go through our lives and have the experience of waiting to talk, which is different than actually listening. Uh, and so you are, if you do this year in and year out, you're learning to really hone in on what is the person next to me or across from me saying? How can I listen to that idea? How can I incorporate that idea? In improvisation, we're also interested in the idea of owning that idea, so your idea becomes my idea. Uh, the idea of a cell phone going off in the middle of moderating is maybe terrifying to you, but to us, it's a gold. Oh, there's a piece <laughs> oh, we can pick up on, was. and then we can own it. <laughs> that's what that was. <laughs> and then all of us have our cell phones going off. So now we have this, with, we have this owned concept that comes from, through just really listening as closely as possible. Yeah. And we also have a, a notion that every single word as improvisers is a gift. Every single word our scene partner uses is important. One word can change the meaning of an entire sentence. Improvisation is founded on the idea of a concept called yes and. We say yes to our scene partner's idea and we add to it. And the difference between yes and and yes but is night and day. There's huge distance between yes and and yes but. So for us, every single word matters, which is why for us to be at a conference like this, when we're talking about the actual evolution of language in real time is fascinating, because as improvisers, we're having to key into all of those changes. People are coming to our theater, and we're asking for suggestions, and they're yelling out words that we may have never even heard before, but they're words, they're real words that people are using. So it's important for us to be actively involved in the listening and the conversation. Right? With the theater, we serve the community through laughter. That's part of our mission statement in Improv Boston. I can tell you everybody that's, uh, that performed for you tonight, the performers, we actually work a lot with children. Uh, Corey O'Rourke, our wonderful rap master MC. <laughs> uh, he and I both do a lot of the summer comedy camps. And last summer, we would break for lunch and have to like meet and say, 
they said this, this, and this. I don't know what those things are. Did you Google, <laughs> did you Google them? I did. I do, they still don't make sense to me. I, don't, I feel like they're very inappropriate and we should be writing letters home to parents. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, it's moving so quickly and, and keeping up with it can be very challenging. Well, that's but, what you were talking yes, about. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, do you feel you have to do that as a stand-up comedian with 84, how many, 86, probably 90,000 followers by now? Do you feel you have to be on top of that? Well, I think you, you sort of find the middle ground of like your point of view and like the world around you and how you, your space in it. And I think, you know, sticking to that is sort of like your guiding, guiding light of like where you land. Cause it's like, if I, I'm, if I only wanted to play to teens, then yeah, I probably would be more <laughs> linked into like slang. But I think it, you sort of learn from your audiences too. You see what works and what doesn't and you sort of adjust accordingly. Because it is a real divide. I mean, I remember when all the texting and everything started, for the longest time, I thought LOL <laughs> meant lots of love. Mm -hmm. So I'd be writing my nieces and nephews like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I really hope you do well at school today, LOL. <laughs> 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 yep. and they, they, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it, it's, I'm wondering if you feel, you feel that divide, you know, in comedy too, like, oh, there's somebody out there who really is not getting what we're doing because we, we are in a language divide. I mean, there's a, a whole language that's been created. I mean, I think that you have to present yourself as a person. And I, I think that uh, it was funny watching the panel before I've known Aparna for a while and follow her work and I... Uh, you know, that question always does come up, like, are women, are women funny? Uh, no, they're just people. They wear pants sometimes. Like, <laughs> we're just, it, it, be a human first, I think. Be a person, be relatable. Mm -hmm. Find your voice. P choose what you want your voice to be. And I think that that's what we should be doing in life as well. I think comedians are gifted because, uh, and lucky, and it's not. I was, I was uh, talking with a, a few of the guests prior to this event, and, I said, it's not lost on me how lucky we are that we get to use words and we get to, we get to present our ideas and things inspire us, we get to share them, and we get to also flip them on their side and find the funny part of it, so. I think the piece of uh, what Kelly's saying about the storytelling component is it's so important. Uh, before I got to Improv Boston, I was with the Second City in Chicago for about a decade, and uh, when you get hired to the Second City, you get a salary, and you get a subscription to the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and your, uh, your goal is to be as on top of all of the news and current events as humanly possible. Uh, and in the time I was there, the sort of the news timeline was speeding up so quickly. What uh, Glenn was saying about the uh, tragedy plus time equals comedy. Well, time gets shorter and shorter and shorter every year. And what we were struggling with uh, at Second City in those days was actually finding the humanity behind the news story. It, you can't just regurgitate the facts because now, you know, it takes three months to produce a, a Second City review. By the time that three months has elapsed, the news cycle is old, old, old. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking for is what is the humanity behind the news? How do you create characters and relationships that will stand the test of at least six months, if not the test of time? Uh, and I think uh, on some level, even in improvisation, that's what we're looking for. What is the humanity? What is the story? What is the real human interest behind this? And when you can expose that and explore that, the audience is going to be on your side, even if you're dealing with really touchy, edgy uh, material that maybe not everyone in the audience is on board with. If you present humans interacting, you have this empathy and this connection. And, and that's and I think it was true for what Aparna was doing, too. She's just so relatable. She could say literally almost anything. And I'm, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Oh, good point, right? She just uh, draws you in. I, th I think that's really important. But you know people to... change. Sorry? <laughs> people, change. <laughs> people change. So maybe tomorrow it's not the case. <laughs> it changed right now, Aparna. We're going to have to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I just think, too, that when you start thinking about words, and we were before we came here, Everything starts to just, if you can see the humor in it. Like, I, I was tweeting um, uh, your last name, which is Carpio, and it ca kept coming up carpool. Yeah. And so it's like, okay. <laughs> Professor Carpool. You're Glenn the Carpool. <laughs> I mean, you know, just see, going with it, going with the, you know, where the words, whatever they are, where they take you. Um, we've got just a few minutes. I know you all want to race back and see the Republican debate. Oh. Oh. First time Trump faces Megyn Kelly, come on. <laughs> Um, but what we'd like you to do, we're going to put a microphone uh, somewhere. Middle aisle. Yes, middle aisle here. The great people who are, by the way, taping this. Oh. This entire event is going to be able to, yeah, so yeah. it's going to be all of it. 
Thank you so much for you running. So come on on questions for anybody. Um, maybe you've uh, read Glenda's terrific books, um, Laughing Fit to Kill, um, about uh, comedy through an African-American prism, mm -hmm. or if you're a Twitter follower of uh, Parna, or you want to leave. <laughs> Which, Fleeing from the microphone. Oh my God, they're racing. Witness protection. This is that improv people. fear everyone has. Yeah. I didn't plan a question. I should go. They're all sneaking out right now. Thank you. Here comes the pity question. No, I okay, said. I said, <laughs> I said. How did you know? Thank I'm ready. you for saving us. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a pre-med student at MCPHS University, and I just happened to see this talk um, on my newsfeed. Very relatable. And I was so back to kind of like the serious question of how would you, I guess, ask a woman to take off the couple of layers that society kind of places on them and um, to show their real selves, so. Wow. Yeah. Good question. That's, tough. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, or yeah, like, I what mean, do you yeah. think of Trump's hair, too? That's <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, I think, I'll just say in all seriousness, I think it starts with not imposing those on women in the first place. So it's being more aware uh, as parents, as educators, that our, our, young, our, our young children don't have to grow up with uh, one or the other. They don't have to grow up with things uh, put on them. Let them be the kids they want to be. And I'm not a hippie parent who's like, don't give them rules. I have two kids. They have some rules. Um, <laughs> but they, I, I have tried to let them be the people that they want to be. And I know that's difficult once they leave the safety of my house. And I was the mom who walked into preschool and said, he does not have to be what you're telling him to be. He does not have to play sports. He does not have to do that. Let him sing. That's what he wants to do. Let him be the kid he wants to be. And then doing the same thing for my daughter and teaching her that she she should have a voice and she should be a self-advocate and she should stand up and say, I don't want that, you can't do that, don't do that to me. And it's something that our schools don't often encourage in kids, but I argue that is the way to raise adults that are going to take action and be great citizens is to, I heard a quote once that in school we tell kids to sit down and be quiet and no one has ever changed the world by sitting down and being quiet. Right? We need to teach them to stand up and say what's on their minds and say what they believe, which is a very long answer to your question. I don't know the answer to your question, but uh, that's how I would start. I mean, it's incredibly, it's a powerful question that goes pretty deep, and we are, we're, we're grappling with it uh, on our own level at Improv Boston. Uh, you know, we have about a year-long course if you want to study improvisation with a bunch of different levels, and we've begun to actually bake some of that into the curriculum itself. So, you know, when you walk through the door, one of the first things you're gonna hear is, you can be anyone you want to be here. This is a safe space. We're all kids on a playground playing pretend. Ultimately, what we did up here tonight is to play make-believe for 25 minutes and get paid a little bit for it, right? It's pretty impressive uh, to make a career out of that. Uh, the extension for the many comedians or uh, uh, aspiring comedians who come through our doors is this idea that for at least three hours this day, this week, you can be absolutely anyone you want to be, and no one in your class is gonna tell you you can't be that. Uh, and on top of that, uh, you got a little taste of it tonight where we did the switch characters, and then Greg jumped in, and he was doing the vocal fry right at the end. <laughs> so we'll do a lot of that sort of switching role play in classes to expand the horizons, not just of the ensemble, but of individual players who can step out of their comfort zone and maybe try on a role that it would never occur to them to play. Uh, the only stipulation is that any role you step into, you're playing with integrity, and you're playing to the top of your intelligence. So you're never punching down, and you're never scoring, at a laugh, uh, scoring a laugh at, isn't it funny that a woman might be playing the president? Or isn't it, a, isn't it funny that a guy might be playing a woman in the scene? That's never where the humor comes from. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. Just, if I may, Go. Uh, <laughs> if I may, uh, as a performer, uh, so I came to Improv Boston to do improv in, uh, late in life. Um, prior to that, and still now, I do stand-up comedy. Uh, I think it's important to get out there and perform and set an example to people to be exactly who you are. No apologies. Uh, this is who I am. This is the body I have. This is the person I am. This is the voice I have. Uh, it's sassy. It's Kelly. <laughs> and I'm going to say what inspires me. I'm going to talk about the things I want to talk about. I'm going to play my belly in front of a room full of people <laughs> because it was appropriate to what we were doing. And I, I was inspired by that through the conversation. 
uh, set an example to be who you are and it'll set an example for other people to be accepting of it and it will inspire people to want to do the same. Thank you so much. Trump's hair is ridiculous. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah how is that? I mean, please. Not hair. <laughs> oh, this, so this isn't actually my question, but you were talking about you know, going to school and telling them, saying, let my child be creative. Mm -hmm. I just want to let you know that there's a study that shows, this is true, that people who, they can tell with 99% accuracy whom you're going to vote for, Republican or Democrat, based on how you feel, whether you feel your child should be creative huh. or obedient. Mm. So when you're going to certain states, I would say, don't tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, I, but, but my question is, um, apart now, I've spent a lot of many years in India, and um, I don't know if you go, but I'm just wondering when you do, because the humor there is in some ways similar, but in some ways very different. I just wondered if you ever go to India and whether you change the way you do humor uh, based on the, that difference in the audience. Well, I actually haven't performed there. Um, I, I have family there still, so I visited, but not in that context. So unfortunately, I can't speak to that. Uh, but I know that stand-up is like now a thing there and is sort of like burgeoning, but is still sort of in the uh, initial phase. So I am very curious to go and, yeah, try to do comedy there. Hi, there, bud. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. <laughs> I'm Sarah, a local documentary video producer. Um, I was thinking about what I believe Robin said at the beginning about, or actually I don't remember who it was that said it, but talking about the, I think the transgender rights group that had uh, right, asked Stephen Colbert. It was Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah, it was Elizabeth, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, asked Colbert and, and John Stewart to openly, you know, work with them on influencing, you know, because humor has power. And I, guess, I just wanted to kind of hear your guys' thoughts about the, uh, the potential power of humor as, you know, somebody asked Neil Gaiman once, I think, what he, he said, uh, people always think the opposite of funny is serious, but it's actually not funny. And um, <laughs> I just wanted to hear your guys' thoughts about, especially in this very politically charged time, about kind of the role of humor in challenging uh, existing power structures, whatever that might be. Yeah, well I think we've seen Jon Stewart and his show has been a huge, huge cause, uh, a huge uh, sort of lightning rod for so much change in the last few years and most, uh, most young people getting their news uh, when he was still running The Daily Show from The Daily Show than any other source I think is pretty powerful. Um, I think satire, and, uh, and parody can be hugely powerful, uh, and nothing changes society faster than holding a mirror up to it and saying, can you see how ridiculous this is? Do you see it right here? Uh, I have a friend right now who is touring the country um, in, a, in a satirical Trump-Sanders debate. It's called Trump, it's called Trump versus Sanders. Uh, it's touring the country right now. He's playing the Wilbur uh, in, in a few weeks. Um, and he is a, this is a guy I went to college with, he is a staunch Sanders supporter, and he's playing Trump. And the reason why he's doing it is not for laughs, although it's hilarious. He's doing it because he feels like there's such a short distance between actual Trump and something really bad that's about to happen that he's taking the character to its logical, satirical conclusion. So if you, you can go online and look at transcripts of the show, and it is so powerful, and the audience is laughing, and they're uncomfortable, and they're not sure what to make of it, but they walk out either loving the show or hating it, but they walk out knowing that they came there to hear. It, they were delivered a message, whether they intended to get one or not. And I think one of the great things about comedy is we get away with saying a lot of things that other people can't. So we're not standing up and saying, come hear us preach about politics or come learn uh, this valuable lesson. We're saying, come laugh with us. And then we're sneaking the other stuff in. Um, because when you are laughing, you're more open to hearing a message. <coughs> Yeah, I worked on this show called Totally Biased. That's no longer oh, yeah, on the a, air. Just but a little show. Just a little show. Just a little show. Top show. No, uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was on FX, but it was it was in the spirit of the Daily Show. It was like a late night uh, talk show. But 
addressing sort of the intersection of comedy and social justice. And the host was like this liberal uh, San Francisco comic named W. Kamau Bell. And I think it was just really amazing in that it brought voices to TV that hadn't had a place there before. And, and just the fact that someone was delivering these viewpoints that was not, who has not traditionally inhabited that space is like huge. So I think it's also, it's not just bringing social justice and comedy together, but it's also like, who are we giving a platform to do that? I do think you have to um, think, take into consideration the context of the humor, right? So like uh, the uh, John Stewart show is gone. So is the Dave Chappelle show. So is, you know, so there's a kind of limited span in which comedy can be effective before it gets commodified, before mm -hmm. it gets, uh, even before time eats up the blunt, the blunts its edges, right? So you have to, you do have to think about um, wit, the longevity of social justice and humor. It can happen in a flash um, before it actually goes in to feed the very thing that it's critiquing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a complicated thing about social justice and comedy. And I, I think it's important also to, to keep in mind that for everyone in this room, we're talking about comedy's power to speak to social justice or to speak truth to power. Uh, but comedy is just a vehicle, and that vehicle can carry pretty much anything. So when you look at what is the mass American consumption of comedy right now, it's not actually The Daily Show as much as we'd like it to be, or Samantha Bee's incredible new show, Full mm. Front, or which if you're not watching, you need to. Uh, it's Two and a Half Men. It's uh, Jeff Dunham. It's uh, Blue Collar TV, right? Uh, it's comedy that does not seek to inform or enlighten or elevate the conversation is comedy that seeks to score a laugh at whatever expense. And it sounds like I'm talking down to it, and I don't mean to, because that is a very large swath of the comedy industry right now. Um, so it has the power to do a lot more than that. It also has the power to punch down and just derive a laugh at any means necessary. I think we're going to take, uh, do we have three more questions? I think I'm trying to gauge the line. Yep, yeah. so let's make that the, the, three, the next three. Thanks. So my name is Tina, and I'm here at Radcliffe this year doing a fellowship. But in my regular life, uh, I'm in a profession where I'm always, almost always the only woman in the room. Uh, I'm a neurosurgeon. And um, I'm kind of humorless. But, <laughs> um, but, I, but uh, I think that there are many situations where people are uncomfortable with you, where humor really is helpful. Can people learn it? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you for the softball. Uh, <laughs> you should take the I'm class. About to get a plug just, right there. I just coached. This is so funny because I just threw Improv Boston. Uh, had a one-on-one -on -one coaching opportunity last year for a woman who, uh, a lovely woman who had gone through our stand-up program, and she needed one-on-one -on -one coaching. And she, uh, similar to you, uh, was. Uh, many degrees, I'm assuming you have to be a neurosurgeon, that seems yeah. pretty big. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she, you know, very intelligent, super intelligent woman, and we basically sat and had sessions uh, where I was helping her just tap, she was hilarious, hilarious, and she just didn't quite know how to t flip the switch. That's the only difference between someone who says that they don't have humor, is that, and, and, and this group basically, is that we know how to flip the switch, right? we can turn it on a little bit, and we're not afraid to like find the words. And yes, you can be taught as I'm telling you, please see us after. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll just say that I came to this work through classes, that uh, I, was, uh, I was a teacher and uh, wanted something that was like gonna be fun for two hours a week, and I Googled it and found Improv Boston and thought, oh, I'll sign up and take a class, that'll be fun, I'll never perform, I'm just gonna do that and go home to my kids, and that'll be great. Um, and what I found by week three of my first eight-week class was, oh, this is, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, and this is going to change my life forever. And it wasn't because they were specifically telling me to be funny. It's because they were telling me to be myself and find the truth in myself, and then the, the comedy will come from there. 
Um, so I, I cannot say enough about improv classes. They completely changed my life. Um, we do have the largest comedy school in New England, so please <laughs> visit us online at improvboston.com. Um, and again, we're not, we're not teaching you to be funny. We're teaching you to tap into what it is in you that's already funny. And I would argue by the time, just based on the timing of how you delivered, I'm not funny. Brilliantly funny. This room laughed, right? You know what you, you got did. got a huge laugh from this You know room, what you so. did. You're fine. <laughs> you know what you did. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, my question kind of follows on from that question. My name's Dana, and I'm a perennial student, a bit of an intellectual magpie, but right, how, right now I'm home with my 13-month-old baby. <gasps> Yay. And Congratulations. We Congratulations. A, thank you. We were at a mom and baby group, because they're mom and baby groups, not parent and baby groups. Yeah, right. Um, and my baby was wearing lots of blue, blue diaper bag, blue water bottle, and one of the other moms there with a baby dressed in frilly pink says, so you're, you're, what's your, your, your child's name? And I said, her name's Evangeline. She says, oh, so she has an older brother. And I said, no, we just like all the colors. And she then turned to the other mom on the other side and said, I thought, I thought, you know, because of the blue, I thought it was a boy. And I find what you're saying about comedy holding a mirror, I always I struggle to come up with a response to that. How do, how do you find a balance between <laughs> being comedic enough to hold up a mirror and not being offensive that, cause, so that it causes someone to double down and not listen? It's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know that I always do that successfully, uh, especially in moments like that. Um, I was yelled at by uh, like a woman in her 70s at the grocery store once because my child, my baby was wearing yellow. And the woman came up and said, your daughter's beautiful. And I said, thank you, this is my son Jackson. And she yelled at me, mm -hmm. you shouldn't put him in yellow. <laughs> <And> <laughs> <laughs> what? That makes no sense. Uh, and my retort to her in that moment was not very clever. Um, I think I said something to the effect of, you should wear yellow. Like, it wasn't funny at all. <laughs> but I, I don't have, in those moments, a lot of impulse control. Well, I realize uh, I, need to, I need to have a repertoire of something I can say, so I'm not just doubling down. And Yeah, I think, uh, you know, they're the ones with... They're, they're the ones bringing their own stuff to it. Um, so hold up a mirror to them. <laughs> like, you said her child was in like all this ridiculous yeah. pink stuff. Like, yeah. you know, find something to make fun of her baby is my <laughs> advice. I'm sorry, I shouldn't. No, I don't know. Don't make fun of her baby. I'm, I don't know. That, 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 <laughs> that wasn't me, helpful. But, but but I, did, I didn't want to, you know, make her get even more. Well, I think you're right. So, so your original question before I told you to make fun of another infant was, uh, was how do you... My baby's got teeth. What's your baby got? <laughs> yeah, just, just turn it into a game yeah. of who's got the better baby. Um, you would win, gay. obviously. I, but you, you, you very seriously asked, uh, how do you not provoke people? How do you yeah. use humor and then not just provoke the beast and, and it becomes more... Uh, it becomes, the situation becomes worse, right? Yeah. Um, and I think uh, all of us as humans have to figure out where that line is of where it's not worth it. Um, my job as, as an improviser and a comedian and an entertainer is ultimately to entertain. My job as a person is to be true to myself and have integrity, and those two have to align. Um, as an improviser, I'm not gonna purposely get up on stage and offend anyone. Um, but if you're making fun of my baby, I'm probably going to say something. But I wonder if you didn't handle that beautifully. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah because I feel like you did, right? Like, Thank you. we really like blue. It, we like all the colors. I, right. I, I, I guarantee you she was standing at Starbucks later being like, my baby can wear all the colors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I think you did exactly what yeah. you were supposed to do. You were lovely and pleasant, oh, pleasant, you. and you didn't have to, like, well, my baby wears blue, and your baby's wrong. It, like, I think you just pay, you gave the answer. It was an honest. That was my best answer yet. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. great. I mean, I, think yeah. I, have, a, I have a stepson, and uh, as soon as people find out that I'm a stepmom, they go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? But it's the same type of thing where people are like, they've got these buckets that they think yeah. everybody belongs in, right? Like, oh, you're just a stepmother. Oh, oh. Like, I just, you know what I mean? So I feel like 
So I always correct them, and I've actually, I don't, I'm, I feel like I'm getting off topic, but I want to give you the example. My, he's 10 and a half, and I've been with him a long time, and I, uh, he even knows now to say, because I say it at home, and we, we believe it and mean it, right? Whether he was my stepson or adopted or, or whatever the situation is, my, my birth child, whatever, uh, he will now say to people, um, she's my mom by love, not by blood. Yeah. So, oh, I know, oh. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so literally, I think you're handling, that's exactly, why can't we say in a nice way exactly what we think? That is better advice than making fun of your baby. Although I would love, you seem so nice, I would love to see her throw down about babies. Yeah. Your baby's so bald. I would love to How see it. How bald is she? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Come take a class. Yes, we'll I can teach you how to make fun of yes. other people's babies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we've time for one tab. last question. Thank last you. Night. All right. I've been standing up here trying to think about how to make this concise. Okay. Uh, my name is Amelia, and I work for the Theater Offensive. And a lot of uh, what you all have been talking has been stirring and firing connections in my brain. Um, and one thing I was thinking about is this idea of people change, language change, mm -hmm. stuff changes. And then we sort of talked about people creating that uh, change. And uh, one play that came, I'm a theater artist, and one play that came into my mind around this is uh, Brahmani by Aditi Kapil, uh, where Brahman, who is a trans intersex young person, plays with, messes up, throws in our face our ideas of binary gender, um, and does it sort of through this stand-up lens, so the whole show is, is in stand-up. And I'm curious, you know, I watched that show about a year ago, and it's against the backdrop of so many trans women of color being murdered, and the real deep danger and risk in truly being yourself, in showing your true colors, and in participating in that radical self-creation. Um, so I'm curious how either as scholars, solo artists, or as a group, you can kind of balance risk and locate yourself in the skin you're in, in the body you're in, in the space you're in, to be that agent making that change through language. Kind of a complex question, wow. but Great anyone, question. go for it. <laughs> uh, I will put in a plug for the Theater Offensive. If you're not familiar with their work, go online and look them up. They do amazing, amazing work. I can't thank you enough for the work you guys do. It's fantastic, fantastic stuff. Um, I get, I'll, I'll. Yeah. All right, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, <laughs> I think improvisers have it easier than in some other art forms because all you have to do is show up and be brave enough to trust your own voice uh, in an ensemble of other voices with people also trusting their voice and then whatever whatever weird you know casserole we make on stage together is uh, is what it is in that moment. Uh, it's certainly I think trickier for playwrights uh, or performance artists uh, who have to get every word right. Who or professors. Or professors yeah. <laughs> uh, who have to, you know, who have to deliver a lecture that has to be spot on. You know you're going to get challenged by every student in your class. Uh, with improvisers, once you learn to trust yourself and trust the ensemble, you know that whatever experiences you have uh, that lead you in your life up to this point are going to be respected and celebrated on stage. And ideally, with the kinds of crowds we get in improvisation, the audience is going to connect with you and celebrate right along with you. We don't get a lot of laughs with derogatory or scapegoating or uh, punching down sorts of humor. Um, so it's a little bit, it, we, the art form in that sense, uh, makes it a little bit more supportive for us. Uh, what's most interesting is when we step outside of our improv bubble, uh, we do a lot of workshops, anti-bullying workshops in schools across New England, uh, social inclusion workshops, uh, and that's where we're trying to take the principles of improvisation, support, trust, saying yes to yourself, saying yes to everyone else, uh, and then seeing that play out in a real world seventh grade, eighth grade, 11th grade, 12th grade scenario where those principles are not necessarily agreed on, not just by the students, but uh, dare I say the, the teachers and some of the higher level management as well. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road and uh, it is not easy, but we keep fighting the good fight and trying to change minds one at a time, you know? I think one thing that I've found tricky as a stand-up and an improviser and just a comedian in general is like, I mean, very much 
if you're a stand-up, you're just bringing yourself to stage and like really just you being authentic to whatever you believe and who you identify as is is being honest as a performer. But I think sometimes in both stand-up and improv and comedy in general, like people, um, I don't know, like sometimes in improv it would come up where it was like some person playing a character of a different race or like a different sexuality and it's like, where is the line of like appropriateness between them playing it authentically and them sort of doing a caricature just based on their frame of reference and not intended to be harmful. But I think sometimes the audience will tell you where that line is, <laughs> but you're, there's definitely, I've seen failure of like, oh, don't do that accent or um, <laughs> yeah. don't walk like that. Or, you know, it's like uh, comedy involves a lot of failure, unfortunately, and making people uncomfortable and finding those lines societally, like where we're at. Well, at the highest level, it really involves literally um, being willing to get burned. As you probably know, if you know the work of Richard Pryor, whom I've been invoking throughout, he literally set himself on fire. But one of the ways in which you can read that is that he talked about so, so much about the toxicness of American racism that he literally burned up through it. I mean, the, the, like the, the comedian is someone, comedy is a ritual, right? People gather uh, to ritualize all kinds of um, aggressiveness, right? And the laughter is the cathartic means by which we get rid of some of that aggression, right? Um, and I think that, that in his case is a really intense example of, that speaks to your question. What does it take to be able to speak to your truest self, right? In his case, it was really a willingness to be so, to walk this, fire, like line, right? And he fell, right? Um, and there is, I mean, in terms of who we are as performers or in, of every different kind, you know, Robin as a performer, as improv improvisers, as comedians, as just the everyday performance of the self, right? It requires that you know how far you can go or want to go, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I, I find most, uh, it's gonna sound like a really weird non sequitur, but one of the things that I found most interesting about teaching at Harvard when I first got here is that with principal failure, a, a fear in students is the fear to fail, fail, right? But you're never gonna learn if you don't know how to get off the horse and get back on it, right? So I think in every kind of performance is that playing with that fire of failure, right? Will it get you to learn and go to a higher place or will it mean that you're just burnt mm. and you're done, right? And that, that knowing, like playing with that line is where a lot of humor comes from, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What a, what a great evening, what great questions. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna thank again, I think uh, Dean Cohen has some thanks uh, as well. And here she comes. Well, I just want to ask you all to join me in thanking everybody who participated tonight in giving us a wonderful, wonderful evening. <laughs> and showing us, I think, that they have an incredible way with words. Um, I hope you will join us tomorrow when we go deeper into these topics. But once again, let's give them a great round of applause.